for a, a Q and A. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a Q and A button. So where you can press on that and, and write any questions you might want to. There's also a chat function. Uh, many of you who do Zoom will be aware of that. Uh, I suggest you use that if you want to make any comments of, of, of any kind. Um, but um, there we are. My name is uh, John Osmond. I'm, I'm part of the organizing team for the festival. Um, I'm a journalist, former director of the Institute of Welsh Affairs. But most importantly, for what our discussion this morning, I've known our speaker, uh, our guest, Professor Garthwin Jones, for the best part, I think, about 25 years. And it was in the mid 1990s that he introduced me to the concept of sustainable development. And we never looked back. Uh, Gareth is a, a botanist of some standing and graduated from Bangor University in the early 60s. He spent most of the 60s in universities in California researching the mechanisms of plant adaptation to drought and salinity stress. Uh, a matter of some importance for our main theme this morning, which is how we should confront climate change. In the 1970s, Gareth returned to Bangor Universities and in the 80s, by now a professor, established the Centre for Arid Zone Studies there. And in the early 90s, he became Chief Scientist and Deputy Director uh, of the newly formed Countryside Council for Wales and was responsible for a number of innovative agri-environmental schemes, uh, which are still being discussed today in the context of Brexit and all the rest of that. Um, later, he, after the Countryside Council, uh, he returned to the University in Bangor and travelled the world investigating the impacts of climate change in far-flung arid zones from Egypt and Syria to Southern Africa. Today, we are discussing Gareth's important new book, Energy, The Great Driver. In it, Gareth brings together concepts from the worlds of science and the humanities, of economics and ethics to provide a holistic analysis of the greatest challenge ever to confront humankind, climate change and its impact. Now, for someone like myself, for whom science is largely an impenetrable maze, um, the book's essential engagement with some key scientific concepts is a challenge in itself, but don't be put off, it's very rewarding. For instance, you will need to get to grips with the primary notion of homeostasis, which is essential for sustaining all living organisms from the single cell to the complexity of the human being. But once you get over that, you will need to consider four billion years of evolution and challenge the influence of energy on our planet, which leads me to my first question, Gary. In your book, you develop what to me is a completely new perspective on climate change. You link it to the whole evolution of life on Earth going back 400 billion years, as I say. And you argue it has been driven by successive revolutions or perhaps step changes in sources of energies, ones that have been gathering speed. Can you explain this process in the simplest terms as possible, uh, how you reach the analysis and how it should inform the way understand, under, we understand what climate change means. <laughs> Thank you, John. I, I, I'll, I'll try and explain uh, as, as simply as I can. The, the first thing to realize that everything in this world depends on changes in energy. So that, uh, and that in order for life to exist, one has to have a source of energy to fire up life, if you like. And that's been known for, for many, many decades. So the first question is, how did life originally manage to tap into a source of energy in order to create a living cell? Because you can regard a living cell as an island of order in a cosmic system of increasing disorder. That sounds a bit abstract, but it's what the physics tells us. So from the practical point of view is, it, the evidence is that life started on Earth about 3.8 billion years ago. And everybody goes on about the DNA and about the genetic code and all the stuff about the virus now has made that very much part of the public discourse. But in addition to that, in order to have a living cell, you have to have a source of energy. And the interesting thing is that there's been quite some um, progress made recently in identifying a possible source of that energy. Not certain, but possible. And the likelihood is 
that it is through vents that are seeping very alkali fluid from the bowels of the earth into um, very complex structures in the bottom of the ocean um, where you have an interface then between this very alkali fluid and the more or less neutral ocean. And so you get a gradient of pH, which is a gradient of protons, and that gives you electrical power. So the idea is that this is how life was originally powered. Now, I don't want to go into the detail of how that might occur uh, because it becomes complicated and involves quite a bit of biophysics. But the whole idea is that life depends on a source of energy. And as life has evolved, there have been various step changes in the way new sources of energy or new major changes in the economy, the energy economy have occurred over the last four billion years. So the first revolution I refer to in the book is the evidence of the energizing of a first living cell. The last universal common ancestor from which we are all derived. And that in sense is an amazing concept. You think we're all derived, derived from a cell that evolved uh, 3.8 billion years ago. The beginning life was entirely dependent on geochemical sources of energy for, it looks like about a billion years. And then after a billion years, so we're talking about 2.8 billion years ago, gradually the capacity evolved to tap into another source of energy, namely sunshine, radiant energy from the sun. It appears the pigments evolved, chlorophyll, which were able to trap this energy, and then with a the biochemical mechanism to split water into hydrogen, protons, and electrons, and oxygen. And this was a huge transformative event in the history of the Earth. And again, the protons were used in essentially the same mechanism as it evolved a billion years earlier to generate the energy to run the cells. And I'm not going to go into the biochemistry. So that, that then allowed a major revolution because we now had unlimited supply of energy to run the earth from photosynthesis. Also, there's another big change because the release of oxygen changed the chemistry of the atmosphere, the chemistry of the seas and the chemistry of the rocks. So the whole of this, this is if you like Gaia as we were talking about earlier, that the earth now changing itself and adapting itself to this new future. But oxygen is actually quite toxic. So there were real bi biological problems in coping with this oxygen. And then we have another billion years of simple cells. And the evidence is that there were two types of simple cells, things we call bacteria, which is the, the name we're used to, and another simple cell called archaea, all these cells were very small and they had virtually no internal structure, but they did have DNA so they could reproduce and they could transmit information to the next generation. And then it appears that about 1.7 billion years ago, there was another big step change. It appears that one of the archaea cells was able to ingest one of the bacterial cells. And so they became a hybrid, if you like. And this is a process called endosymbiosis. And it was discovered by an extremely famous female scientist, Lynn Margulis, a number of many years ago now. But the crucial thing is that the bacteria that was ingested into the archaea cell lost its, most of its DNA, most of its genes. And so it's be it became a thing called the mitochondria, which is a little powerhouse in the cell. So now, it, now you have a complex cell with a complex structure called the eukaryotic cell, which we've discussed together, John. Uh, and uh, this complex cell had much more 
energy available to it per gene so it could do much more work. And this complex cell now, the amazing thing is... And this, this was the third energy revolution. This is the third energy revolution it, and it occurred about 1.7 billion years ago. And all complex multicellular organisms are made of these eukaryotic cells. So you and I are made of eukaryotic cells, as are the oak trees outside, as are crocodiles and lions and everything else. So we had the evolution of, of life from that moment in terms of, um, you know, anim, uh, fish and, and so on in the oceans that eventually found their way onto land and so on. So yeah. what drives then what, how do we come to the fourth revolution that you described? Well, you, for then another billions of years, first of all, there was probably a, a big step change about 450 million, 500 million years ago appropriate enough for this seminar called the Cambrian Explosion, where suddenly lots of multicellular organisms appeared in the oceans. And that could be related to a change in the oxygen concentration, but let's go right on. Then biology and evolution took its course and there were major extinctions. Lots and lots happened. I'm not suggesting nothing happened. Lots and lots happened. But there was then a fourth revolution, which is a crucial change. Gradually, in order to organize this complexity, of course, brains started to emerge. And organisms became more and more capable of coordinating through the use of their brains. And then our ancestors, the Australopithecus species, started to invest more and more energy in better and better brains which is better and better information processing. And probably about now only 2 million years ago, there was a big jump to a, a, an ancestral species called Homo erectus. And Homo, with the advent of Homo erectus, the brain started to increase from a relatively limited capacity, about 30 million neurons to our brains that have about just under 90 billion neurons and about 100 trillion synaptic connections. So I'm looking at you, John, in front of me now, and I'm looking at a computer, a, a very, very, very able computer. So you went from 30 million to 90 billion, is what you no, said. No, from 30 million, 30 million to 90 million. 90 million. But, but within the 90 million, there, there were the links between all the cells, these are called synaptic junctions, and there were about 100 trillion, which is 100 million million junctions yeah. in our brains. But what you say in your book is, is that uh, the brain, this, this size of brain, I mean, requires a lot of energy to function. Precisely. And, and this, this prompted the, the, the fourth um, revolution that you... Yes. This the concept, point. which is really due to a man called Richard Wrangham in Harvard, was that at, at this time, our very earliest ancestors, the Ashrabakilas, were vegetarians, but th that's not the sequence of modern vegetarians. They were not able to cook their food. And so, with the advent of Homo erectus, the idea is that we've started to eat not only eat more meat, but also to cook food. And when you cook food, you increase this digestibility very substantially. And the extra energy and the extra nutrients from cooking food was invested in better and better brains. And that has enormous social implications because then you get the development of social life and social interactions and possibly an early capacity to, to speak to each other in some way or other. And that's about one and a half to two million years ago. So, so, so cooking, it's interesting, isn't it? C cooking is one of our revolutions. Uh, uh, but, the, but basically this increased the calorific intake, which an, allowed the brain to expand to, to in terms of its, its, its functionality. So we, we, moving swiftly on, the fifth revolution then you describe is... is, is um, uh, well, the, 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 we now get to much more well-known territory. The next one then is the agricultural revolution. We lived then as hunter-gatherer cookers 
for, for between about 1.5 million years ago to 10, 12,000 years ago. So for that period, and there were various types of humans, there were Neanderthals, and the evidence is now that Neanderthals could talk to each other as well, interestingly enough. Um, but about 12 million years ago, we settled and developed that methods through agriculture for increasing the amount of energy that we had available to society on a massive scale. This allowed us to live in communities uh, and in villages and in towns. And, and this, of course, also had the effect of increasing the, the requirements for record keeping and for writing and for the transmission of information. So this was a, a huge change with the agriculture. It wasn't all good because it all started dictatorships and empires and all the other things we're conversant with came in at that time. But this was a huge change and, and humans started to take over the world at this point in time. Prior to this, the numbers were very small, but the combination of the energy and the brain power really allowed us to take over the world. Then we jump to the sixth revolution, which is the, the one we're all aware of, the industrial revolution. For, for all that period of time, the billions of years, life had been entirely dependent on annual photosynthesis, a little bit from trees, but essentially we depended on the annual photosynthesis to trap the energy to run our lives. And then there was this revolution, I, I, you can attribute it to Watts or New Coleman or whatever it is, but in, in the 1700s, we discovered that we could use power from fossil fuels to run engines. And there's this wonderful quotation from Bolton. We have, sir, what everybody desires, power. And that's from the, the 1770s. And that power has transformed the world. That's industrial revolution. But, of course, the price that we paid for that power is that we produce CO2. And that CO2 is now leading to the seventh revolution. So the seventh energy revolution, as you say, I mean, uh, has resulted in the pollution you know, from our burning of coal and oil yeah. uh, during the last 200 years of the sixth revolution. I mean, just to pause a moment and go back to the beginning, you know, I mean, yeah. Each revolution has happened, you know, with greater rapidity, hasn't it? It's, it's speeded up. There are two uh, underlying factors. The one that you referred to in the introduction of homeostasis, and each of these step changes and others in between, then you have to have regulatory mechanisms to stabilize the new structure. And the, we know about this in human life because we, we test our blood pressure, we, check the electrolytes in our blood and we know that you have to have mechanisms for stabilizing our bodies but you can see there's a hierarchy right from the first cell right through to a complex society and this is an idea due to a man called Antonio Damasio in America that's that's one strand the other strand is this incredible increase in in the speed of change and that I think again is a tribute to the physics because if you have energy, you can do work. And the more work you do per unit time, the more power you have. And that power causes change. So the more energy you have, the, the more rapidly everything changes. So we, but originally that things happened on a billion year time frame. Now we've got 20 years <laughs> to, 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 to react to, the, the, the fossil fuel revolution. So what you say is that in this latest seventh energy revolution that you yeah. chart in your book, you argue that we will have to access the sun's power without producing the damaging side effects in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I take it what you mean is we'll have to utilize renewable energy forms such as solar and wind power, yeah. uh, but how feasible will it be to generate the power we need from these sources? I mean, well, we have to devise some new technology, such as an energy efficient way of separating 
hydrogen and oxygen mo molecules in water, say? I mean, will renewables be enough? Well, there, there are lots of questions hidden in the, what you said there, right? There is, there is theoretically plenty of solar energy um, arriving on the surface of this planet. The question is, can we actually organize ourselves in such a way to utilize it? So, so the, but the second, if you then become not, not on a planetary basis, if you think of the Sahara, then the Sahara has got plenty, plenty of solar energy to uh, energize Europe and Africa. So that is that there's not an absolute technical issue there. The problem is transmission. And if you have it more local, then of course it's very intermittent and, and you've got day and night and seasonality. And how are you going to adjust our lifestyles to that? And behind that, there's another issue. If we actually have plenty of energy, if you look at my model, then you will actually speed up things even more. And can humans cope with another jump in the speed in which everything happens on Earth? So I'm actually advocating that we should try and live on much less energy and that we should slow down and that that would be the much better and more humane solution to our problems. Rather, and to do that, then it eases the problems of producing enough renewable energy. Yeah, I see. Well, in, in your book, you, you argue that, I mean, taking that point you just last made, um, you, you argue that in order to tackle climate change, we're going to have to collaborate. Uh, humanity is going to have to collaborate much more on a global scale, on a global basis. <laughs> And you say appeal to the rational side of our of our nature, and by that I think you you divide our instincts, our human instincts, into two: what you might call the emotional and the rational, and say there's a kind of a tug of war between them. On the one hand, there are our, our intuitive emotional reactions, which lead to, I suppose, short-termism, um, denial of reality, uh, the kind of fight and flight reactions that you developed during our experience when we were hunter gatherers so long ago on the other hand there's the more considered more rational side to our nature which seeks to base our actions on evidence truth and i think you quite rightly i think you, you argue that it's this latter side that we need to emphasize in order to have a hope of gaining the global collaboration we need to tackle climate change as, as humanity as a whole but when you look at the actual evidence in terms of the way human beings actually behave, um, which side of our nature is actually winning out in this? I mean, is it, uh, I mean, from Trump in America to Brexit in Britain, I mean, it's a pretty bleak picture, it seems to me, that to hope that the rational side of collaboration is gonna kind of win out uh, uh, against uh, the, the more atavistic uh, characteristics of our nature. Yeah, this, this is almost exactly why I wrote the book, if you like. It's because um, our regulate, internal reg, social regulatory mechanisms are derived from the hundreds of thousands of years that we've lived as hunter-gatherers and small farmers. We've only lived in large cities very recently as um, 250 years, n n a, a second in biological time. And, and so we basically behave as if we were hunter-gatherers and we, we, are, we, are, we are tribal and we, we are instinctively reactive. And, and it is that inheritance, in my judgment, that is making it so difficult to respond to climate change. And as you rightly say, it is very easy for populists to claim to, uh, to appeal to our hunter-gatherer instincts. And it seems to me, Trump was absolutely brilliant at it. I think uh, he, he, he had this capacity of, to um, appeal to the hunter-gatherer in us. But the difficulty with climate change, it is anticipatory. We are trying to do things now in order to avoid problems for our children in 20 or 30 years time. And we're not hardwired to that. So that requires a huge amount of 
intellectual and political investments that the society is ill prepared to make. On the other hand, you know, if you look at with what's happened with COVID, it shows you when society puts its mind to it, how quickly science can react. I mean, it's been amazing how, how, how quickly medical science has reacted to COVID. So we can do it. It's a question of whether we psychologically are capable of doing it. Yeah, well, towards the end of your book, you know, you offer a number of scenarios of the way things might play out in the next 30, 40 years. I mean, um, you know, you offer this, a scenario of catastrophic collapse to one in which, you know, humanity gets its act together um, in the way it has done, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with COVID, as you just said. And, um, but in this case, it delivers the Paris Climate Accord Agreement to some real effect. But you, you, but you also say in the book that you, the conclusions from your, your analysis of all of this are, are, quote, not very reassuring. I mean, do you have any, what grounds you, for optimism do you actually have that somehow we're going to be able to deal uh, with, the, with the climate change crisis? Well, it's absolutely essential to be optimistic, isn't it? Um, you know, it's the optimism of the will and the pessimism of the intellect, the, the old the quotation from Gramsci. Um, you, you, if you analyse the situation, then there are obviously huge dangers facing humanity. And those dangers are, again, largely social. Uh, I, I, as you said in the introduction, I've worked quite a bit in the Middle East and in, and, and in Africa. And if you look at a, a place like Jordan and you look at the rainfall data for Jordan and see it going down regularly, it's an extremely depressing situation. If you look at the communities that we worked in in, in Southern Africa, the average rainfall was 200 millimeters of rain a year. That's eight inches average. So you know, if anything goes down slightly, that they're, they're scuppered. So yes, there, there are real problems. Um, on the other hand, humans have this amazing capacity for thoughts and for action and for analysis. The difficulty is that the, the rich, including ourselves, are those that have benefited most from fossil fuel burning. And the rich tend, and again, this is well established in behavioral psychology, to be protective of their riches. And so you're asking the rich to actually uh, change their lifestyles in order to look after the poor. Um, is that gonna happen? I would like to think it might, but it needs incredible political leadership for that to occur. Well, I mean, you, you might say, I mean, an example is um, on our own doorstep with the, the European U Union and trying to protect its borders from uh, people fleeing the impacts of climate change uh, yep. from North Africa. Yep. Uh, I mean, that, I mean, that kind of migration, which can only, the pressure from that can only increase. Absolutely. That. But I mean, how do you judge that we're coping with that? Well, you've got to do two things. You, you've really got to cut our emissions very quickly so that the effect on them is limited. And also we've got to really start investing properly in their society. I mean, <laughs> one of the things that really gets me aerated and, and cross is the fact that we have these uh, tax havens which encourage corruption in the third world. So, so many of the third world leaders are corrupted by our system to put their money on the Cayman Islands or wherever it might be, so that in, the investments are not taking place in those countries to create the situation which allows people to live pretty well there with low carbon footprints which has to be the, the objective. Hmm. Well, I suppose it is true that there is now a growing consensus, isn't there, across the world really, that we need to drastically reduce carbon emissions. But, you know, the thing is, as coming back to this question of optimism and pessimism, I mean, 
it doesn't seem to be much of a consensus of how we're going to do this in, in a suff oh. sufficient scale that we need. I mean, you mentioned in the book the need for our finding the political will yeah. uh, to undertake the action that we need and on the scale we need. And, and you give uh, two interesting examples of where in the recent past, uh, internationally, it's a, a political cross-national, you know, um, uh, interventions have occurred. You mentioned, for example, the, the post-World War II Marshall Plan, which rebuilt the devastated economies of Western Europe after the war. And another example you give was, you know, not on quite the same moral uh, terms, but I mean, President Kennedy's commitment in 1961 to put a man on the moon within a decade. And it happened because the determination, the will was there. But by comparison, you say the political will to combat climate change is tepid. That's yep. your word. Yep. Um, you know, what, you know, I, I come again to the problem and to, to the issue that, I, that, that, that worries me. I mean, what, what is the evidence that we're actually going to somehow contrive to find the political will uh, to undertake the, the, the change that's required? Well, I, I'm not a, I'm not a political leader, uh, and uh, it, it is up to the political leadership. But it is up to people like ourselves. It, it seems to me the only value in in, in my little book and, and lots of other books that that are covering not this similar territory is that they are, are trying to put the problem clearly to follow fellow human beings. And asking the fellow being, look, these are this is the best evidence we have available of the situation that we're facing, and this. So we have to have this seventh revolution. It, it is up to everybody then to react. On a personal level, you can put PVs on your house, you can get your EV car, and you can decide to to go drive less to to try and eat more environmentally friendly food. One of the things that really scares me, John, if, you, if we're into the scaring business, is that in fact something like 30% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are from the food chain. And a number of years ago, we did calculations on this and we showed that even if you decarbonize the energy economy, the fossil fuel economy, um, <clears throat> including that proportion that goes into the food chain, the food feeding ourselves will post 2040 will perpetuate climate change. And, and, and this is a huge one. There's a big behind this, a moral issue. This is, really worried me for years because of the work we were doing. <laughs> if you look at many of the semi-arid parts of the world and the mountainous parts of the world, for thousands of years, there's been a synergy between people and ruminants, you know, of cattle and sheep and goats. And that's how Something like a billion people around the world are living now. How can we say to them, no, you cannot have your animals. You cannot live with your ruminants because we, the rich people of the West, have created climate change and now have to cut emissions so drastically that you can't have your animals. I mean, there's a huge ethical issue there. And I've never seen that discussed. I've never seen it discussed. So you, you say to the Maasai in Kenya, you can't have your cattle because I want to go on, on my holiday to Abu Dhabi. But, I sorry, I mean, but, but isn't it by comparison, I mean, the emissions that <clears throat> advanced economies are, 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 are creating, I mean, yep. America par excellence, I mean, the Chinese, I mean, the, they're, they're still building coal-fired power stations. I mean. I mean, it's that which we've got to replace, isn't it? I mean, that's actually, rather than look at uh, basic agriculture that you describe. Partly, I mean, if you look at the emissions, China has more or less the average per capita emissions. So you've got to do it per head, haven't you? Um, Wales has higher cap per capita emissions than China. So that, that's, that, you know, we have to remember that. Uh, America has higher emissions than China, but a place like Niger has about a seventieth the per capita emissions of China. So, it, so it's a, we have to look at the per capita emissions. 
But this, this is the, this is the, the fundamental problem. We have a, a, an economic development model, um, which China is following, which requires huge inputs of energy. China is, of course, also the major investor, not only in, um, in coal-fired stations, but also in renewables. So China is, I think, trying to move up. And I think it's, a, it's false to, to blame China for our own emissions. It's worse than that because we in Wales, because we were at the for, forefront of the Industrial Revolution, we've actually already used our historic share of carbon as well as the current share, whereas the Chinese have not used their historic share in the same sense as we have. So the, the, yes, gl global equity is at the heart of this issue. And, and we have a capitalist system, which is not based on equity, but based on greed. I, mean, I come back to a point I made earlier on about the, the, the need. I mean, you said we need to uh, reduce our consumption of energy. You know, yeah. we need to slow down. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there's, it seems to me there's little evidence that, uh, that the wider humanity is willing to do that. Um, so I come back to the question mm -hmm. is the answer, part of the answer going to be finding new sources of energy which don't emit uh, the greenhouse gases. And we referred earlier on to, before we started this conversation, to James Lovelock and his latest book. But as I understand it, Lovelock is a, 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 an advocate of nuclear power. Yes, he is. Just because of this, it doesn't emit green, greenhouse gases. I mean, is this the way? I mean, there is a, there is a very serious argument in favour of nuclear power in places where it's safe to do it. I cannot see it work. I can see on a UK basis that nuclear power could provide some of the answer, although I, I, I wouldn't advocate it, but I can see that it works. Internationally, the places I've worked, I see no way nuclear power could be the solution to the global problem. Two of the places I did a lot of work have been Aleppo and Maiduguri in northern Nigeria. If there's a nuclear power station in Aleppo, some mad bugger would have, would have blown it up in the, in, in the Syrian civil war. And in Maiduguri, Boko Haram would see it as an opportunity. So the idea that you can put nuclear power stations all around the world when we have such a fragile social structure around the world seems to me for the birds. Putting one on Wilva, I don't think Anglesey people are that dangerous. So I don't think Wilva is under great threat. Uh, on the other hand, there's a real problem of matching um, nuclear power with renewables. Because the, the problem with the renewables is that intermittency. Uh, the problem with uh, nuclear is that it needs to be producing permanently. So th they don't match each other very well. So nuclear power, yes, it, it's a possibility, but it's not the road I would go down. I think we could, if you, if you take the example of, of, of cars now, EV cars use only about the third amount of energy to travel a kilometer that a, a petrol car does. So there's a big net gain in energy use simply by switching to uh, EVs. Okay, I, in the time we've got left, I think we should, there are a, a number of questions. Um, uh, some are posed in advance of our, our discussion. Anthony Rippon asks, uh, is managing an increase in photosynthesis a reliable method of lowering greenhouse gas levels? Uh, if so, how can we green the deserts by irrigation and fertilize the nutri nutrient poor regions of the ocean? If this is not possible, is there a plausible alternative method? Well the, well, the answer to the first part of that is definitely yes. I mean, increasing uh, photosynthetic carbon capture is absolutely essential. And that's why many, many people are advocating uh, tree planting on a massive scale. And we in Wales, 10 years ago, I wrote a report with um, Harvard Prosser to Welsh governments on land use and climate change. And Welsh governments uh, <coughs> agreed to increase uh, the woodland from 300,000 to 400,000 hectares and sod all has happened in 10 years. But the, the, the principle is absolutely correct. We should be uh, increasing the, globally the amount of forestation. 
Um, doing this on oceans, yes, people are advocating this. Uh, iron fertilization of the oceans to increase phytoplankton is a possibility. I'm a bit scared of geoengineering. We, we are still locked in, and you're locked in yourself, John, to the idea that uh, progress is using more energy. And I think that unless we get away from that idea, um, then I think we're in real trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sean Hughes asks, well, says that on page, he's obviously read your book, on page 169, you say, quote, it is a conceit characteristic of modern society, especially homo economicus, I'm not pronouncing that right, economicus, that accelerating complexity can be equated to progress. This can only end in disaster, you say. And uh, Sean's question is in two parts. Can you describe this disaster? What kind of world would we be living in post this disaster? And what would be different to the world we live in today? That's his first question. And then he says, in order of importance, can you describe the things that humanity would need to do in order to avoid the disaster you describe? Well, that's, <laughs> that's going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a phenomenally good question. Um, there are, there are so many potential disaster routes that, that it's, it's difficult to know where to start. But I would say at the, the outset, it, 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 the, the simplest disaster case is if, in fact, we had uh, unrestrained global warming and parts of the world then become too hot to live in, other parts of the world become too dry to live in, and we all get pressed up to the north and the south and the, 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 the central. But, Already there are parts of India where the temperatures are over 45 degrees regularly and it's becoming unbearable and farmer deaths are going up substantially in those areas. So there, there are lots of differences. But I, I suspect the disaster, more like it's, again, is more social. It's more the way, it's what you said about the people crossing the Mediterranean in search of a better life. Um, it, I, I suspect the disasters that we will face are a gradual breakdown in social order. And that the response of that is that people will become more tribal, more self-censored, and we'll have more walls like the wall Trump was trying to build between Mexico and America. And that that is the, the way it'll go in the immediate future, unless we really get to terms of the problems and say, no, we need to collaborate and work collectively for a collective human future. Yeah, I suppose, but you know, the problem is, is that, you know, we're having, as you said earlier, we're, we're, I mean, we're being asked in effect to do things uh, to prevent future things happening. Yeah. The, the future things we cannot <laughs> see in, in, immediately in front of us, yeah. but we can see the people trying to cross the Mexican border. Absolutely. This is what's so interesting about, you know, intellectually interesting about the problem. It's challenging humanity in ways that we've never been challenged before because we've never had a problem which is both global and anticipatory and that we're having to plan now for the good of our grandchildren. Uh, and that's never been the case before in that sense on a global basis. And what we do here in Wales matters to, as to what happens in the South Sea Islands and what happen, what China does will make a difference to the sea level in New York in 50 years time. You know, that, that, that we've never faced a problem like it. So, I mean, is the answer or part of the answer more international global governance really to take the global action that, that we need? And how capable are we of that? I think it has to be done. It has to be done globally, yes. Um, sometimes you think we need a really good disaster in order, you know, preferably on, a, on, a, on, on in somewhere which matters. If you have a major global disaster in somewhere it doesn't matter, uh, the powers that be will, will take no notice. Um, I, I, I had great hopes of Hurricane Sandy at one time. <laughs> because because it did hit New York, <laughs> and that matters. Um, 
but it passed, I'm afraid. It, it wasn't disastrous enough. Something has to wake people up uh, and the leaders of the world up. Because it's so easy to for for Trump, and then there are there are Trumps in the UK, there are populists in the UK that are still climate change denying, very well known people. Um, um, Lord Lawson is a, is a is a name that comes to mind, uh, and they are powerful people, and uh, somehow we need to overcome their influence. Okay. Um... Sean Hughes, again, I have an uncle called Will who lives in Tlenethly and he disagrees with Gareth about his evolutionary theory. He says the world was created in seven days by his God and he did <laughs> most of this in the dark to boot. What does Gareth say to him? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, thank you, Sean, for that. Um, <laughs> it's very difficult to be People have beliefs that, from my perspective, are irrational. Uh, and uh, fortunately, they are a minority, I think is all one can say. Um, I would ask the, the gentleman in Llanelli to look at the evidence. But all the evidence, <laughs> unfortunately, is that if you have a very strong belief, evidence will have no impact on you. <laughs> Uh, Adrian de Corsi uh, says, do you see the major oil companies such as BP and Shell as part of the solution um, with a shift, their uh, aspirations to shift to renewables or as a continued part of the problem? They're both, aren't they? Uh, they're both because there is evidence now that BP is, is shifting and realizing there are these, this, this thing called stranded assets. That these large companies have huge holdings of oil which they regard as assets, which in fact are not assets at all, but are, are a, a major danger to the earth. Um, the evidence is that uh, we have to leave something like three quarters or two thirds of the all known oil and gas assets under, under the ground if we are to avoid catastrophic climate change. But the companies now are realizing that um, th their assets are no longer valuable and they are moving to renewables. If they did, this would be a terrific thing because they have huge financial clout and technical ability. I mean, one of the big problems is, is developing storage systems, batteries, uh, pump storage systems. And as you indicated earlier, John, um, the uh, compression and the conversion of energy into hydrogen so that we have an alternative to methane. So yes, these companies could do an enormous amount if they, if they turn, uh, turn to it and invested heavily in it. Okay, I, I've only got a few minutes left, so I should do two things really. Um, I'd like to um, uh, quote the Dean of St. David's who's, who's put up a, a, a message in, in, in relation to the religious question we considered a moment ago. Uh, she said, most Christian traditions for most of history understand the seven time periods of Genesis as metaphoric, not natural. <laughs> Likewise, the Jewish tradition. So there's that. Um, a final question, it comes from um, David Lloyd, Councillor David Lloyd, I think. Um, Could you mark the urgency of climate change on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is too late? <laughs> <laughs> about seven, I think, in that case. It's not too late. We could do something about it. We could react. Um, can I just say one other thing? I think there is another revolution going on as well, and that is the one we refer to with Jim Lovelock, the, the, the artificial intelligence. So there's another revolution going on at the same time. We live in interesting times. We need to have a revolution to combat climate change, and we also need to come to terms with electronic um intelligence at the same time so that the, the the challenge to humanity is absolutely amazing well I, that, I, I think we can do i still think we could do it if we get inspired um the, the question is who's going to inspire us well i i think Gareth, that you've done a bit of inspiring the, this morning and uh, for that on behalf of uh, the friends who are watching i'd like to thank you very very much indeed uh, and uh, 
I urge everyone uh, to read the book because uh, I think the more we understand, I mean, the more we understand the background and the causes of, of the dilemmas that confront us that you've articulated so well, the greater the chance that we have of addressing them. And on that note, I would bid you all farewell, but keep watching the St. David's Festival Ideas, which continues during the rest of the day. Thank, Thank you very much, and apologise to the chats and the Q&As that we haven't answered. <laughs> Thank you.